the real focus of today is to talk about this integrated view that Vikram had mentioned. We are not here to focus per se on Paris, nor on economics of discoms, but more just on the energy and carbon uh, integration between different fuel choices. Because one of the questions people always ask, coal is growing wonderfully or the targets are there. MNRE renewables, India has some of the most ambitious targets in the world. With the discoms, we see that the financial limitations are hitting them and some of their purchasing has actually tapered down less than projected from the supply side. So they are backing down both thermal as well as even renewables, which is in some ways a shame because the marginal cost of renewable energy is zero. It should never be backed down. So we need to come up with mechanisms to ensure that that does not happen in the country. And so we're looking at grid integration. What do utilities do? If you do projections, it's always a dangerous game. People talk of 2050 as the carbon target, but let's see for the next five, 10 years. This is the time of day, day load curve for five years across all India. This may be the first time because we've compiled it bottom up from every DISCOM, uh, ev all, uh, all the states, five minute data for five years. And what you see is between 12 midnight, one day, the average for every year. So in 2009, it's the bottom curve. And over time, it is almost identically increasing. And two things hit you. One, there is a pronounced peak at an all India basis that is in the evening, around 8 PM. These are the numbers of India. This is load as supplied. Second, so what's missing? Now, when we talk of a supply side, we then uh, have to ask, well, what is missing? First. And we have discontinuities. You see 6 a.m. There's these little spikes, jumps downward. And second, you have another dip at 6 p.m. This is a manifestation of phase rostering, where irrigation pump sets are not supplied power. So we do not necessarily have true unrestricted demand node. Second thing that's missing is load shedding. We don't have full data on what is the true demand in the states. And if we talk about new prog programs and projects in the government, the official data as of now from CEA are still assumption driven. They are not instrumented to actually measure what is the shortfall of power. So this is the Karnataka load curve, load duration curve, saying hourly in 2013, what was the load served? So this is the supply side or load met. The 8760 max, uh, sorry, the lowest load was under 4,000 megawatts, the maximum load was above 8,800 megawatts. And the bottom is the load shedding at each point in time over all the hours in the year. Karnataka has a SCADA system, so it's the only state in India that can actually instrument and tell you how much is going on. What we notice that's relevant to both coal and renewables is these are not perfectly correlated. You would normally think that at the lowest demand, there'd be zero load shedding and you'd have maximum load shedding at the maximum demand period. This is not the case because this is a supply constrained world where when, for example, renewables are maximum, which is seasonal, you may actually cut down your load shedding if it happens to contribute towards the peak. So this is where we need the data to tell us are renewables contributing, correlated, not correlated. So before people say renewables are against or with the demand curve, we need the data. So Karnataka data, actually show us that it's not as black and white. Even in the low demand period, you have load shedding. Some of this would be unscheduled. This is a very typical load curve out of wind. These are two years of wind data in Karnataka, one minute resolution. The installed capacity is 2,000 megawatts, but very seasonal wind is in the monsoon season, as expected. The average PLF is 22%. This shows you what solar looks like. These are data from a paper of Goa, where hourly between 6 a.m. and 7 p.m., you're getting different outputs. Maximum comes in April, minimum comes in July. So that you get between four and seven kilowatt hours from solar. So now if you overlay it, now looking at coal, looking at RE. This is a curve showing 2014 real data and extrapolating to 2019. And right now solar is a small portion. But as solar is growing as per projections, X thousand megawatts, then we are seeing that it creates a ramp up 
and a ramp down requirement. So what does that mean? Either coal will have an implication on its plant load factor, or we need other generators suitable for ramping, which typically are one of three, open cycle gas turbine, hydro, or in internal combustion engines. And of course, people talk about storage, demand response as other candidates. If we talk about renewables in the future, India is very, very different from other countries because we do not have the same strength of a grid. And most importantly, if you look at Germany, which is 25% RE as an energy basis, we are today at 6%. Then Germany interconnects to Europe. So that's four times larger than India. So our 6% today is the same roughly as Germany at 25%. And fundamentally, we are at a point where we still have a capacity challenge to address, and it's not just an energy challenge. Simple example of that is we are surplus different times of the day, but not all the time. And we have limited peakers. So the problem is we are not in equilibrium. Today, when the wholesale price in the power exchange is th under three rupees a unit, discoms are not buying. And uh, we hope in the discussions we will hear more about it. So the issue is, what will this do to PLFs? If you look at renewable energy, two methodologies that are chosen. One is you treat renewable energy as negative demand. The other is you say that what is the additional load that you can serve by adding RE? Just like if you add any power plant, it increases your capacity. Well, how much additional load can you serve is the value of capacity of renewable energy. A snapshot of US, 1,000 megawatts roughly is their capacity. Coal is the largest generation and its capacity factor was roughly 60%, and renewables were 35%, which is interesting because our renewables are typically 20, 22% sort of a range. India, last year, excluding RE's data, we see that coal and hydro have a split, and not only do coal and hydro have a split, there is a pronounced split between state and central. Central units are always higher than state units. Now this is very, very interesting from a carbon perspective because newer plants often are central and they are more efficient. But at the same time, from an economics point of view, state units can be cheaper because they're amortized. They're state-owned, so the load dispatch center in a state only sees the marginal cost of these generation folks. So maybe we need better policies. One of the drafts of CERC today says thermal plants must be asked to come down to 55% output in response to grid conditions. Meaning, when wind picks up suddenly, for example, not to pick on wind, but just to use it as an example, any generation, grid change, thermal can be asked to come down to 55%. Question is, is that optimal from a grid perspective, either on a carbon basis or even on an energy basis? There are wear and tear and other implications. So in the future, we will have a change. We cannot take today's numbers and just multiply by two to come to the future. Because in the future, as per government policies, load shedding will come down, so your peak will increase. Second, irrigation pump sets, which are filling the valley. The nighttime load in India is very high, but we don't believe the irrigation pump set load will grow to the same manner. And for example, irrigation pump sets are now being put onto solar, because that is clearly more cost effective than diesel to start with no-brainer today, and even other power when you're shortfall, solar power, because the time of day you can water your plants at different hours of the day. Putting this in perspective, today India is at a certain RE level, and let's assume the 175 gigawatt targets that are out there are met by 2022. Now whether it takes one year here or there doesn't change the dialogue. But by the time renewables increase 4.375 times from today, other energy, especially coal, will also increase. So that means that we will decarbonize, but only at a rate of minus 1.65% per annum. And this is only for the electricity sector. It does not factor in vehicles. So how does this compare to what the global needs are? These are carbon intensity of ton CO2 per ton of oil equivalent. These are all the countries in the world. Only France has had a substantial decrease in carbon and that has been because of nuclear energy. They were building 30 large-scale reactors simultaneously for five years. We are not at that level that we can achieve that. So decarbonization rates have varied over time. Even with France, they achieved a minus 1.54 rate 
only, percentage per annum, sustained. We are looking at 1.65 when we achieve the RE targets of 175. But unfortunately, is that enough is a different question from a carbon perspective. Because the target is to actually get to 2% decarbonizing if we are to meet certain ambitions that people have talked about. So I'll skim over the economics and come to the policy suggestions for discussion with the panel and especially Secretary MNRE. The challenges are balancing coal, renewables, demand, all three of these together sustainably. Grid integration, pricing power better, and also measuring carbon and other uh, emissions. Not just carbon, but even local air pollution. So some of the options talked about is, can we do better signaling? Do we need larger balancing areas? Because right now, the state is the de facto balancing area. Maybe we need to think regional or improve the power flows within regions. Europe shares power better across countries than we are able to do across states. We have to fix that. Second, we need new markets to capture the marginal cost of electricity, which could be time of day pricing. We need peakers. Today, there is no incentive for peakers. And when, like Tata Power, for example, Mr. Sinha can maybe share some data, they actually procure peaking power. That ultimately needs to get passed on to the consumers. We must value load shedding as having a cost. We'll come back to this later. We need wholesale markets. We need to start measuring data and instrumenting it and reporting it. So power plants, we need to know what are you consuming every minute or five minutes at least, at least hourly. It is not instrumented. Discoms, uh, we, we have from uh, PFC who can maybe share in the discussion section someone telling how we will actually instrument the feeders across India. Because we need to know the true demand and how much is rostering and load shedding. So can we talk about green ratings for India? Can we talk about load shedding as having a cost? Now, one of the things that's interesting, when we figure out how to measure and handle load shedding, it's the same tools that will help us with RE balancing. Because you will need peakers, you will need new balancing, ancillary services, smart grid. So the same tools that can handle load shedding could have synergy to helping renewables integrate. Maybe we can think of new RPO mechanisms that don't say how much RE does your state do. If a state has hydropower, maybe we can value that as a collaborative RPO contribution. There should be some credits available to that. Europe is actually doing that. Germany, which is the leader in RE, actually is using pumped hydro in neighboring countries to help its balancing. So similarly, can we also rethink of our RPO mechanism that said if this state does not have RE potential, but it's got hydro potential, then they can get some <coughs> benefits or credit towards that. So that's a policy mechanism that we could create. So in closing, we want a better portfolio. If RE is treated as negative demand, would this have long-term implications for coal? Is there a point when RE is not just additional new things, but the core of what our system is dealing with? And what does that do to the grid? Fundamentally, the West has worried about what is called the utility death spiral. As consumers say, I will generate my own RE, they exit from the grid. They don't exit entirely. They'll still come back at night or the peak. So the grid is acting like a battery for RE. How do we value that? There is a cost. There's a worry people have asked. I don't know the question answer, but we would love to hear the panelists' view, Partha and others. What, what would we do when developers say, I don't want to build coal plants, fossil fuel cost is increasing, I would rather build solar, which is good maybe from an economics point of view from a developer, but what about at a system level? And can we start monitoring and measuring these things better? So thank you for allowing me to rush through some of these. I want to hand it over to uh, Vikram to uh, allow, uh, have our panelists share their remarks. Thank you.